All right, guys, this is a quick look at Chapter 2 review questions. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was really clear on how to do all the problems in the review. The answer key is online on my website for you to check out, but I just wanted to go over a couple things. Sometimes hearing my voice is a little bit different, maybe better, so here we go. Here are a couple of the problems that concerned most students. Number four. The following statistics were taken from a large set of data that describes the prices of houses in thousands sold in a particular city over the summer of 2016. Now, give two examples as to why this data does not fit the normal model. There's actually several different examples you can get, but I just want to give you kind of the top two. So the first example as to why this data is not normal is to just compare the mean and the median. All right. Notice that they are very, very different. The mean is much, much higher than the median. Now, when you are nice and normal, right, we all know what the normal model looks like, when you're very, very symmetric, your mean and your median are both located right in the center. Now, they don't have to be exactly the same down to the, uh, you know, 15th decimal, but they should be very, very close when you are somewhat symmetric and mound-shaped. So the fact that my mean and my median are a, a kind of a big difference really shows me that I'm definitely not normal. And you should also remember the fact that the mean is higher means I'm actually skewed to the right. Because when you're skewed to the right, the mean is going to go towards that tail higher than the median. So that's what kind of tells me that this data is skewed to the right. So that's a really important feature as to why this data is not normal. The second reason why it's not normal that's kind of really, I hope, easy to understand and important to understand is to look at the min. If I look at the, um, excuse me, if I look at the z-score for the min, right, if I take the min, 45.28, subtract the mean, 128.26, and divide by the standard deviation, 45.21, I get a z-score of negative 1.84 approximately. Now, why does this z-score tell me that I'm not normal? Okay, well, actually, it should make a lot of sense. If I was normal, we know that we go, uh, we have zero in the middle, and we go up one, up two, up three standard deviations, down one, down two, down three standard deviations. And the normal model tells us that there is, um, you know, some data below negative one. In fact, you know, about 16% of data is below negative one, and that there is some data lower than negative two. About two and a half percent of data is lower than negative two. And it even tells us that there is some data below negative three. Very, very minuscule amount, but there is some data. And the problem the problem is, is if my min has a z-score of negative 1.84, somewhere right around here, if that's my min, that means that there is literally no data below it, because it's a min. There's nothing below a min. So basically, I'm telling you that there is no data lower than this z-score, but the normal model, actually, if you go and grab a normal CDF and look below this z-score, you will see that there is, should be approximately 3% of data below this z-score. But if it's a min, there can't be anything below that z-score. So what happens is because negative 1.84 is my min, I literally cut off the whole bottom half of this graph, and you see that you would be, again, skewed right. So the top tail is still here, but the bottom tail kind of gets kicked out, and that is why it's not normal. So hopefully that explanation makes a lot of sense, because that's going to be important for you on your test. So there are other reasons. A couple other people were looking at Q1 and Q3 and identifying that they were not equidistant from the mean, and if it's a nice symmetric mound-shaped data, they should be, and all that kind of stuff works as well. But I think these are kind of the top two reasons why the data is not normal. All right, here's another example, 7 and 8, that I want to make sure is clear to everybody. On number 7, I told you that this data came from data that fits the normal model. I just simply want you to rank these from um, least to greatest. Well, the one way that we can rank things is if they're all in the same value. So A is already a z-score. Let's go ahead and find the z-score for the quartile 1. Some of you may actually remember this, but if you do an invert norm of 0.25, right, the bottom 25% is Q1, you get a z-score of negative 0.67. Also, 15th percentile, well, we could use invert norm. Again, because we are normal, I could use invert norm. And we know that the z-score that marks the bottom 15% of data is approximately negative 1.04. So now that I have all three values in terms of z-scores, it should be very easy for me to rank them. A is definitely going to be the lowest, the smallest of all the z-scores. Then C at negative 1.04. And then B at negative 0.67 would be, of the three, the largest of the z-scores. All right, number eight says, for a set of data that is very skewed to the right, what z-score represents the 80th percentile? Well, here's the problem. If I'm very skewed to the right, unfortunately, there 
is just no way for me to answer this question. Remember, I cannot use normal CDF. I cannot use invert norm unless I am normal. So there is no way for me to answer this question. Now, a lot of kids say, is there even an answer? Well, yes, there is an answer. I mean, somewhere on this skewed right model is a value that represents the 80th percentile. I just don't have any way of finding it because it's not normal, right? The normal is this famous model that we know an awful lot about. A skewed right model, we just don't know enough about or we don't have any fancy feature on our calculator to solve for it. But you have to understand that z-scores can be used on any set of data. Z-scores are not only used for normal data. Z-scores are used for anything. But again, the idea of invert norm and the idea of normal CDF and all of those rules we learned, those only apply to the normal model. Even a percentile, right? Percentiles can be used on any set of data. It doesn't matter what you look like. Percentiles just make sense. 80% of data is below, right? I'm assuming that somewhere right around here is probably the 80th percentile with 80% below it. So there is a z-score that marks this location, but I just don't have enough information to find it because I have no idea that you know, I don't have any command to help me figure this out because it is skewed to the right. So make sure that it was kind of a trick question, but I really want you to understand that idea. All right, 9 and 10 are also some good problems here. So a lot of kids get confused on 9, and it's actually really, really simple. First off, make sure you understand what a z-score is, right? The z-score takes a value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Now, this top value is how far x is from the mean, right? This top value is simply a distance from the mean. Now, in this problem... I'm asking you about this particular pair. Now, what I'm telling you is that the pair is at the 35th percentile. Well, if a pair is at the 35th percentile, use invert norm and find the z-score, and it is negative 0.39. So I know the z-score, right? The other thing they told me in this problem is they gave me the standard deviation for a pair is 0.4 pounds. What they didn't tell me was they didn't tell me how much my pair weighs, nor did they tell me what the mean is. So I don't know either one of these top values, but... Remember, what that top value is after you would subtract them, it's simply the distance the value is from the mean. So how far is this particular pair from the mean? Well, that is this entire top number. So I can actually solve for that by multiplying by 0.4. So if I multiply both sides by 0.4, I get negative 0.15 equals x minus the mean. Now, even though I don't know the weight of my pair, even though I don't know the mean of pairs, I do know that my particular pair would be 0.15 pounds below the mean, because it's negative means below the mean, and 0.15 would be measured in pounds once I multiply the z-score by the standard deviation. And that's what the question asks for. How many pounds from the mean is this pair? Well, even though I don't know either one of the two values on the right, I do know that they represent the distance from the mean. So this tells me that my particular pair is 0.15 pounds from the mean on the bottom side. All right, number 10. On chapter 1 test, the mean score was uh, 76, the standard deviation of 4. Gwen got an 82. So let's just stop right there, and let's find Gwen's z-score on the chapter 1 test. On chapter 1, she got an 82, minus 76, divided by 4. Her z-score should be exactly 1.5 standard deviations above the mean. Now... That was on the chapter one test. I'm gonna make sure I mark that chapter one. Now there's a chapter two test. The mean is 81, standard deviation is five. What's the smallest number of points she would have to increase her chapter one test by to do better on the chapter two test? So on the chapter two test, the mean is an 81. The standard deviation is a five. I wanna figure out what score would she need to do better on the chapter two test. So to answer this, I'm actually going to take this z-score, and I'm going to set it equal to the formula for chapter 2, right? So here was chapter 1 on the left, I'm going to do chapter 2 on the right. Now, understand that this is the z-score that would allow her to do exactly the same on the chapter 2 test. So if I solve this by multiplying by 5, adding 81, I get a score of 88.5. Now, this is what she would need to tie, right? So she got an 88.5 on Chapter 2. She would have an equivalent score from Chapter 1. Well, she wants to increase her Chapter 1 test, right? She wants to do better on the Chapter 2 test. So she basically needs 6.5 points to tie 
right? If you think about that, she got an 82 on chapter one, plus 6.5 would take her to 88.5. So she needs 6.5 points to tie. So what's the minimum number of points that she would need to do better? I guess it'd be approximately seven, right? If you're thinking about a teacher that typically rounds, she would need seven more points to do better on the chapter two test. That would give her an 89, right? 82 plus seven would be an 89 on the chapter two test. And if she did get an 89, she would beat this score just enough to do better on the chapter two test. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, and the last problem I want to quickly go over is one of our famous level seven problems. I think this is really important for us to cover. And I really want you to know how to do these problems because there will be one on the test. Okay, a company that produces batteries claims that the distribution of life expectancies of their batteries is symmetric and mound shaped. That's awesome. That means it's normal. They claim to customers that 99% of their batteries will last at least seven months. Now, let's make sure we truly understand what that means. 99% of batteries will last at least. At least means longer, right? Or larger, or more than, please. A lot of kids miss C least and they think less than. So if I'm thinking about seven months, this means that 99% of batteries will last longer or larger than seven months, okay? They also told us that 32% will last longer than 14 months. So here's 14 months, and they tell us that 32% of batteries will last longer than 14 months. All right, now what they want us to do is figure out what are the parameters for this situation? What are the mean and what are the standard deviation? So over here working with seven months, and I know that 99% lasts at least seven months, which means higher than seven months. So I want to figure out a z-score formula. Okay, well, I know seven minus the mean, which I don't know, divided by the standard deviation, which I don't know, will equal a z-score. And I need this to be a z-score that has 99% above it. But remember, that's not how invert norm works in our calculator. So I would have to do an invert norm of the bottom 1%. Because if there's 99% lasting longer than seven months, that means only 1% is lasting lower than seven months. That gives me a z-score of negative 2.33. So that's my formula for the very first idea there that 99% of batteries last longer than seven months. Now over here, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to set one up for 14 minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And over here, I know that 32% lasts longer. Well, once again, that's not how invert norm works. Invert norm wants the bottom part. That's just how it works. So when I do an, uh, I'm spelling invert norm wrong, sorry. I'm going to have to invert norm 68%, because if 32% lasts longer, 68% lasts shorter. And that is a z-score of 0.47. So I know that a value of 14 months would, re would require this z-score of 0.47, and a um, value of seven months would require this z-score of negative 2.33. Now, first thing I recommend doing is multiplying by sigma. What this does is it gets rid of fractions. Most kids struggle to solve anything involving fractions. So if we simply multiply both sides by sigma, we get rid of the fraction. Okay, at this point, I'm going to work with this left equation, and I'm going to solve it for mu. So I'm going to, whoop, I meant to grab my green color here. So negative 2.33 sigma, I'm going to subtract that 7 over. I do have to get rid of that negative on the mu, so I'm going to divide everything by negative 1, and I get positive 2.33 sigma plus 7 equals mu. So here is a nice equation that is solved for mu. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute that all the way in for this mu over here. So I get 0.47 sigma equals 14 minus, and then in parentheses, I'm going to put what mu is equal to for my other equation, 2.33 sigma plus 7. Now using those parentheses is really important, that way you remember that this minus sign does need to get distributed. So 0.47 sigma equals 14 minus 2.33 sigma minus 7. Now I'm going to move my sigmas all to one side by adding 2.33 sigma over here. I'm adding because it was negative, and that's going to give me 2.8 sigma when I add those together. Over here, I could take the 14, the negative 7, combine them together. 14 minus 7 is 7. 
and then I'm going to divide both sides by 2.8 to solve for sigma, and I get 2.5. Now, depending how you round, you might get something a little bit different, but I, I rounded the two decimals throughout here, so it's a little bit different here. All right, so that is how I got sigma. So that's my standard deviation. Remember, that's going to be in months, just like everything else in the problem. So the standard deviation is 2.5 months. Now I'm going to plug that sigma back into this equation to solve for mu. So if I take 2.33 times 2.5 plus 7 on my calculator, I get a mu of 12.825 months. And of course, you could round that to 12.83 if you want. And it's that simple. A lot of kids get scared of these problems. To be honest, I will point out where the biggest issues come from. Most kids mess up right here because they forget to distribute the negative sign. They don't remember that when you replace mu, you have to put it in parentheses. So that negative sign needs to be distributed. And the other place a lot of kids mess up is right here. They read 99% and they think that that's the below. So they use an invert norm of 99%. But you have to understand that it says 99% of batteries last at least seven months. That means more than seven months. That means 1% is less than seven months. And the way invert norm works, is they want you to type in that bottom 1% to get the correct z-score of negative 2.33. So hopefully that problem makes sense to you guys. Please check the answer key online for all the other answers, but these are the ones that were causing most kids' issues. And best of luck on the test. Pay attention to Twitter. I may be putting some things on there.